Right. So I want to welcome everybody to the first webinar, Crow Canyon webinar of 2021. We've got a great lineup where we're going to try and do a webinar every Thursday at four o'clock, except for holidays. Uh, so we're very excited for this new year, and we're very excited for this talk, Seasons of Navajo 2, by William Sosi Jr., um, I'll try and move quickly through a introduction, a set of introduction slides to not uh, take up too much of Will's time. Um, the first thing I want to do, and by the way, uh, for those of you who joined, I introduced myself earlier, but I am Mark Varian. I'm the Executive Vice President of Crow Canyon's Research Institute, um, and I think the single longest tenured employee here. I started in 1987. And I'm joined as a co-moderator by Liz Perry, who is the president and CEO of Crow Canyon. Do you have anything else to add to that, Liz? No, nope. right. well done. So we want to start by uh, thanking uh, people who made this possible. And that includes um, Dylan Schwint and Taylor Hasbrook of Crow Canyon, who are doing all of the technical stuff behind the scenes to make this possible. We also want to acknowledge the funding we got through the Colorado Humanities uh, and National Endowment for the Humanities through the CARES Act. Um, a little bit of technical stuff. I think most of you are viewing this through Zoom. So one of the things, uh, there's not a PowerPoint tonight. So when we get done with this introduction, you'll just have Will on full screen and uh, we will disappear until we get to the Q&A portion of the talk. Uh, typically what we do is Will will talk for about 45 minutes and then we'll have questions, he'll answer questions. And you, if you get look at the bottom of your screen, it, I think it's on the bottom of mine anyway, there's a button labeled Q of A and typing your questions in there is what you want to do. And Liz and I will monitor those and then ask uh, Will those questions after he's done with his talk. If you're having any trouble with Zoom, you can uh, stream this on Crow Canyon's Facebook uh, through that address right there. And really neat is uh, Taylor edits these and then publishes them on Crow Canyon's YouTube site. So there might be something that you're particularly interested in that Will says that you wanna go back and review, and you can do that by using that link that you see to our YouTube page. Uh, finding Will's talk and uh, going back to that talk. And if you missed any of the earlier webinars, which have been fantastic, the ones we did in 2020, uh, I'd encourage you to watch those webinars too. Um, I'm sorry, I just clicked on something I didn't want to click on. Okay, Liz, you want to tell them about our mission? Sure, thanks, Mark. Um, you can see what, what our official mission statement is up on the screen, so I won't, I won't read it word for word, but uh, wanted to, to uh, express to everybody, uh, probably a lot of repeat folks visiting our webinar and, and lots of people I see on the list that are familiar with Crow Canyon. What's really important to all of us uh, this, this year in, in particular in the time that we're in is that everything that we do right now both our, our programs that we've done for many, many years and the programs, the new programs that we're creating to adapt to the changing world, like these webinar series, we're really trying to make um, a, an effort that everything that we do, projects and programs, all have a component of archaeological research and study of our human past, to have, a, have an, a, 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 an educational component, public education, education for students, and, and also everything we do incorporates some form of American Indian, Native American partnerships, uh, knowledge, uh, and perspective. And I think that that's what really makes makes us special as an organization and makes me and the rest of our staff really proud to be here is that there are plenty of organizations that do one of these three things and we're really committed to bringing them all together in everything that, that we do and just another reason why we're so grateful to have Will here and and his perspective uh, on on culture and, and history and, and meaning and educating all of us uh, and sharing his knowledge and culture with all of us so that we can can better understand our shared uh, human existence uh, and and present and past so thanks mark and i think most of you are familiar with crow canyon but some of you might not be this is a picture of the center of our campus with a beautiful sleeping ute mountain in the background 
So the Crow Canyon, oh, this cuts off on my screen and I was going to read it. Uh, the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges Pueblo Ute, Diné, and Paiute people on whose traditional homelands we work and reside. Uh, we value indigenous people who continue to preserve and protect cultural traditions and relationships and steward these lands. The work at Crow Canyon would not be possible without recognizing and honoring the many generations of people um, that's cutting off on my screen. I'm sorry. Uh, so just want to make that acknowledgement as a part of this introduction. Uh, also want to clue you into the next two webinars, the next two Thursdays. Next Thursday will be the uh, Biographical Revolution in Plains Visual Culture, 1680 to 1880, with uh, Dr. Seb Fowles, who uh, is a professor at Columbia University and one of the most creative researchers in my opinion, working uh, in the Southwest and just in the world today. Then the, the Tuesday after that uh, will be the, a lecture that's co-sponsored with the Hisatsunam chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society, our local chapter here in Montezuma County. Um, and that's going to be on prehistoric use of Florida Mesa near Durango, Colorado, uh, by Tosh Maqueta. And uh, they, uh, the road was expanded there, and it encountered a cluster of really amazing pit houses uh, that they excavated. And that's what Todd will be talking, or Tosh will be talking about. We want to uh, encourage you. I know many of you want to support uh, Native nations during these difficult COVID times. And this is a series of uh, organizations that you can contact to offer support. Um, this might be one of the slides that you would want to go back to the YouTube if you don't have something to write down uh, these links. Uh, they're all really good organizations that are doing really good work during these challenging times. And if you don't get it right now, please go back to the YouTube site and uh, uh, look these over and figure out which one you want to help by adding your support. So the talk tonight is Seasons of the Navajo Two by William Sosi Jr. Uh, William is Navajo and his clans are Coyote Pass people, which is his mother's clan, primary clan. His born for clan is where two rivers meet people. That's his father's secondary clan, or his father's clan, which is his secondary clan, I'm sorry. Uh, his paternal grandfather's clan is Red Street Cheek people, and Folded Arms people are his maternal grandfather's clan. He resides in Lukachukai, Arizona, a beautiful place presently, but considers Say Lee, one of the most beautiful places in the world, in my opinion, Arizona his home, which he makes with his wife, Janice Toya Sosi, and Janice's son clan from Jemez Pueblo. William has a BA in Anthropology and Southwest Studies from Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. He's worked for the Navajo Nation His Heritage and Historic Preservation Department in Window Rock, Arizona as an archaeologist for over a decade. Uh, William's professional work has taken him throughout the greater Four Corners region of the Southwest and the entire Navajo Nation. Some of his academic and scholarly interests include culturally peeled trees, which get referred to as CMTs, rock art, ceremonial systems, material culture, and cultural resource protection for of and for the Navajo people. William has a love for sharing his Navajo people's history and traditional culture, and we're so lucky that uh, he's going to do that tonight. So take it away, Will. Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's a good question. I think it's a Ado <laughs> Um, 
basically, I said, Mark has done my introduction by clan affiliation, where I reside. And, and that itself, for me, being in a space, being in probably a multidimensional reality that includes spirituality, uh, physical being in the landscape, um, that defines us as, as, as people. And knowing this is very important. As now for people, I, I was very fortunate when I was very young. I grew up um, with my grandparents. My siblings came, young, came along who were, who were much younger than I was. And my parents had their hands full with my younger siblings. So I got the luxury of being placed with my grandmother and grandfather. And so it's their world I know. It's their world I lived. And from that, I just saw two very different worlds. And how to na navigate those worlds is by knowing. As, as um, everything to me, a sense of knowing can't be really synthesized or can't be described at times, something as simple as description. And some of the values, the values within that that determine knowing what we choose to believe um, that is our core that defines us knowing that, that knowledge is all in the culture of everyday life. As Navajo people, I was always told that I exist here, I was created here. Four mountains were designated in the four directions. And in the, this designation of these mountains was our home. In there, we were created as a people, the Navajo people of today. Yes, there was a first man, first woman, first human man, first human woman who came up and emerged into this world. And but we as Navajo people have always been tied to our clans. Our clans define us. My clan comes from a Puebloan people. And the headmen's in my clan have always acknowledged that that connection existed. All the clans, except maybe the four original clans, um, they came to, from other places, they were other people. And so the Navajo people were basically a, a confederation of many different nations. I want to acknowledge them, um, I kind of uh, had, had heard this in the stories and um, also heard it from my late Che, uh, Mr. Herbert Benali, who used to teach at the New College. And he said he, when, one time we were talking, he said, what is knowing to you? And I said, knowing. I said, yeah, what, what, what makes, what do you think knowing is in, in, in a cultural perspective? And so um, I said, well, I just, as, as I just told you, that's, that's what I was, I always went by Hanet, what was told, what was said, what is the story. And I put it above stories, not story. For us, it's reality, the reality that is. And so that reality is constant. It's reaffirmed by our living in that, acknowledging our surroundings, which we're an integral part of. And uh, to talk about this is very difficult because that knowledge from, from the moment you utter your first word, from the moment you realize you take your first four steps onto the, onto the earth, the moment you walk out into the, the, the heavens, 
um, protect you and guide you. And, and this is where we live. This is where um, life takes us in. And so a lot of times some, some people can really simplify this in and kind of is shoved off as some, something very simple for a simple people. But I think in there, he don't quite understand, especially in a living culture. And we, we don't trace really um, any other, other designation to come into this, this new people who were created in, in this space. And what binds us together is our language. We are told your language is holy. Your language is power. Your language protects you. Your language gives you the ability to interface with the natural world around you. So in this way, our, our, our language is, is very, very special. And so of all these different groups of people, bringing them together, we came together to be of one one language, of one spirituality. And that's who the Navajo people of today, I think, um, are. And that's, again, this knowing. And it's going to be many, someone who wants to study this, many PhDs, and um, to try to get a, a, a grip of, of, of this concept. And in the, in the Western world, we have to then go off and then we learn another set of knowing. And that's a Western education, a new language, and for some of my people, a new belief, a new spirituality. And so I've always found in my life, I've bridged these two worlds. For the most, I, I, I bridge it very well. I go between and I feel comfortable. And the, com the comfort for me is that what was shared with me was shared freely with, with the respect and honor and I cherish it. And that you can't write that down in a PhD thesis because that facet of, of, of that knowing doesn't exist in um, that or I haven't found the paper that, that tells about it, <laughs> that studies it. <laughs> and so um, as, 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 I was, as I was growing up, um, this is what defines us as, as a people, this whole concept of knowing, the ability to um, to be defined by that which is around you. As I was growing up, everything was a story. The house we lived in was a story. The fire we built was a story. The water we drank was a story. The doorway was a story. The fire poker was a story. The grinding stones, the woman's, um, implement to prepare food, the men's implements to pr for, for protecting. And so some of this knowledge is, is given slowly of knowing. You don't <laughs> say arming a child with a firearm if they're not ready to, to share this knowledge. It, it is spent um, given in a lifetime. A lot of times I've had um, scholars come to me um, that I've come to know and that, and they said, well, we'd like to know about this. What, what, what culturally, what, what, what is this? And, um, and I, I have to tell them, well, do you have a lifetime? For me, I have to look at you like an infant, a child, and I have to take you by the hand. And I can't take you very far because for you to totally understand that 
that that is that reality of the of the question answer that you're trying to to identify. And so it's it's very hard at times. And and I, I, I kind of um, see this multi-generation. I, I, I think in, in what he shared um, over time, this knowledge, um, we know we live in a changing world. That world we have no control of. It, it, it is changing around us. And I, I was always taught it's survival to know change. You must be changing all the time. And so in this way, you have to know what you know and be able to change because it, what it's based on is changing also. <laughs> I know that sounds, sounds kind of way out there, but um, I think, for example, there, there are a lot of new ideas, values. And I, um, when, when I was back at Fort Lewis in, in, in my classes and papers I had to write, I remember examining it from, from that other world up the others, um, what they considered valuable, what they considered was of, of help. Um, or something that um, is, is, is had no equivalent in our world. And so we had to learn many, do diff, many new values and that covers all aspects of, of being human. And so one of the big changes was an economy. When the trade and post system came onto the reservation, it was basically we had to learn to live in a capitalistic society and value many other things of, of having a lot of material needs now that we feel we needed. And so I, I remember, I, I, here's, a, here's, a, here's one story. When I was very young, um, in the winter time, one winter, I was at my with my grandparents, and it was just the three of us home, and it snowed, and I, we heard a vehicle pull up, and it was um, a man that my my grandfather worked with. My my grandfather was a, a translator for the field health service. He translated for the doctors and nurses that went into remote areas of the Navajo Nation. And so he translated um, whatever needed to be communicated um, that had to do with uh, health and had to do with um, that aspect. And so he came to visit and so my there was a knock at the door, and he, and, and he took. A, he came in. You know, he, my grandfather said, "Why don't you spend spend the spend the night? It's too late." And so um, they were busy talking. Then all of a sudden, uh, we heard another knock at the door, and this time it was my grandmother's great uncle. He had come, and he came in. He had a one. One of these long surplus military um, woolen coats, and he took it off. And immediately, my grandmother started preparing food and putting up the coffee and and getting them something to eat. And so I was laying there with my my hands underneath my chin on the on the sheepskin with the kerosene lamp, a hearf with a fire going, and um, My my grandmother's great uncle started to visit with my grandfather and they were talking. And my grandfather translated to the young doctor who he had, who was his co-worker. 
who had come also. And so when they were done visiting uh, and they started to eat, um, I, I guess my grandfather saw on his face that he's want to ask a question. So my grandfather says, uh, would you like to ask anything of him? And so he goes, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd like to know something. He, and uh, the young doctor said, he's lived a long time. He's a distinguished looking gentleman. He's obviously seen a lot in his lifetime. And what has he seen that most interests him of my world, pointing to, him to himself, the young doctor? And he, my grandfather translated as best as he could. And then my, um, my, grandma, my grandmother's great uncles reached for his woolen coat, started to dig in the pocket, and I was wondering what he was doing. And so he pulls out a penny and sitting there cross-legged, um, having a meal, he tosses the penny underneath the young doctor. He goes, I see that your people, that is your God. That is something you will do, some, you will sell your mother the earth for that I have heard. And so my, my grandfather was, was very diplomatic and translated it and, and, and he translated and they were still eating. And after that, the, the doctors, uh, my grandfather said to the young doctor, do you have another question? Would you like? He goes, no, that's very profound. And I guess for me, that for me, that story came back as the whole my when I started to work on a paper about capitalism coming with the trading post into into uh, the, uh, into the Navajo world. Another was when we had cattle, and we used to take them to market in Cortez and um, we would haul cattle there and we would pass these signs and they were um, bank signs and they were saying for sale. And I, I didn't understand that. And my father driving and, and I said, dad, what does that mean? What are they selling? I don't see anything there. And my, da my dad, smiled and laughed and he says this these people out here they buy and sell the land and for me that was very foreign I said you can't do that and, and he, he, my father just said yes it's a very different world out here um, people buy and sell our mother the earth and so it, it, it was really an, an, uh, an eye-opening um, thought, uh, value learned. And, um, and, and so values like this really have changed our, our sense of knowing, especially those of us um, like for me, I, I went through the whole boarding school system. When I when they took me to school, I was seven years old. And the principal says, you're going to first grade, going to quasi hut over there. That's your class. So I went in there and there are the students there. And so I started school just right at first grade. There was no head start, no kindergarten, no preschool. You just started school first grade. And then I went through the boarding school system on, on the reservation. I went to Lugajigui boarding school, Sanasti, Shiprock. And then when I got to high school, my, my mother said, you need to get a better education. And so she, my parents 
decided to send me to a parochial Catholic high school in Santa Fe. So I was shipped off um, for four years. I attended St. Catherine's in Santa Fe. And there, there was a handful of Navajo students who attended along with Pueblo students and um, Hispanic students. And um, and so it, 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 it kind of put me in the, and then into another, another world um, of being very multicultural. And I think at, at that time, for me, the, the, the knowing had reached a plateau that I, uh, my parents saw that education was valuable. There's something they wish me to pursue. And, and so I went off, I furthered my education there. And so um, I think this, as tying it to my, my interest in, in, in archeology, span uh, when I was very young, we go in the morning, get the horses from my grandpa, and they were hobbled, and so it was easy to catch them. We had a rope, brought them in. He, we'd saddle up with him. We'd ride the, the, the range, check in for the cattle. And, um, and so when we'd be riding, our trails veered off away from these areas, the trails would bow out and we're not straight and I, um, I, I knew that you don't bother the archaeology and um, you don't handle any uh, places where there is the possibility there are people that are interred there have, have, have been buried there and uh, because they saw they saw that as the uh, Archaeology eroded. There would be human remains that would that would get exposed, and and so basically, I we I was taught you just don't bother them. But of course, this again values change under, um, and so this this knowledge gets modified. Uh, this knowing gets modified. And um, the first technicians or, or masons that did restoration work at Mesa Verde, Chaco Canyon, and the whole slew of technicians that came out from the huge tribal farm south of Farmington at Napi, um, they were taught to, to deal with and work in archaeology. And, and they took up... Uh, as, as we did ethnography, interviewing uh, people who were near projects, archeological projects going on, um, what they were excavating. We would take eth eth ethnographic information and interview. And more than one, more than two dozen times, I, I ran into people who said, yeah, I used to do what you're doing. I helped build I-40. And we worked for the, the archaeologists. I worked in Chaco. I worked in Aztec ruins. Um, I worked down in Candy Shade. And we, we were the ones that made them pretty. They were just rubble. And so, um, again, here are two stories um, that define us today as me, as a person. And again, this was a separate paper I was uh, I was working on. So it's a work in project pro progress that started when my time in at, at uh, Fort Lewis and my undergraduate studies. And I had some wonderful people who were um, my teachers there. And so they, they, with their support and their encouragement, I, I decided to pursue um, anthropology and and I really wanted to do the archaeology tied to anthropology and ethnography and everything under the umbrella and so um, I told my parents this is what I would like to do for my profession 
And then I remember my mom go, Yad la ol, yeah. Ha'ile ha'ipin, yeah. And basically she was saying, what the hula, hey, why do we want to do that? <laughs> and so um, they, I guess they thought about it. And my father told me, well, if that's what you want to do, you're going into areas where uh, you might need a lot of protection. You'll need to learn these protection ways. You'll need to come to know these things and how to deal with with um, working in that world, that environment. And so that became one of my papers too. And, um, and so um, I think I actually, I, I think I kind of gave uh, a part of the paper over at a, uh, a Pecos conference um, north of Cortez. Um, anyway. <laughs> I, I guess I've been in archaeology now for for some time, um, and what I what I'm doing now really ties to a sense of knowing um, the sharing and the oral history or the stories. I was very fortunate to uh, work with the Nile Foundation Forestry um, Department. And I, 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 and the archaeologist who, who does, um, who works with the commercial force, which is basically all the Chusca Mountains, Mount, the Carrizo Mountains, Napa Mountain, and the, um, the, I think they're called the, uh, the Crown Point Highlands, uh, the, the mesas there where Hosta Butte is, and there's, there is some uh, Ponderosa forces located in there. And so that I knew these places, I knew the stories, the ceremonial stories that, that talked about these places and they have names and the uh, many events happen in these mountains. These mountains are our are, are, are rock. <laughs> it crowns us. It, we we brought this this sense of it was brought by first man first woman into this world. Actually, they forgot they forgot them first, but then they remembered it. They had to send someone to go get the rock. And um, the mountains um, were then put out, and they're they're the ones who basically divine as a prim perimeter of, of our world. And so I, I, I had the luxury to work every day in that that very sacred space. Um, and as I said, many of the ceremonial stories talk about the Chuska. And here in Lukajukwe, uh, we live right near uh, where white shell woman was journeying back from the West and she left down as a sand ridge that comes from the top to the bottom of the Chuska near Lukajukwe. And her cane marks where she was journeying, they were journeying home back to um, the Tlnaotihi, um, um Mesa, the place where there was, uh, the first home was built in this world the dwelling place of first man, first woman, and the, the uh, raising place of uh, white shell woman, changing woman, and so, and, and the hero twins. And um, so every time I'm up on the mountain, I look out and in the landscape, I know all those are stories. That Mesa Verde, the it's called Rantolja, and it's tied to Nightway, Makers Canyon. Uh, very, very um, beautiful things happen, sharing with the holy people. And then right behind Tishnajin, 
which is, you, you call it Ute Mountain, but down in that McElmo Canyon, Mix, there's a story about Mixi Thin Woman. And then my auntie scared me with that story not to be promiscuous as a young man about what uh, Mixi Thin Woman did to Holy Boy. <laughs> like these stories, when they tell them, they're long, they're lengthy, they're, um, and then they don't share knowledge that um, you're not quite ready to receive. So you may hear the same story throughout your life and whoever is telling the story, the Khanet will look at you and think, well, are you ready for this, this aspect, this, this part of the story? And so um, it's, 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 it's um, going to be another lifetime for me to really get down and try to communicate or try to do, try to communicate this this sense of uh, knowing, this sense of knowledge within um, a living culture. As, as um, it was drilled into me, we didn't come from no place else. We were made between these four mountains. And so <laughs> that's a story. <laughs> um, when, uh, maybe I'm kind of running short of time here. Um, so uh, try to wrap it up here in a couple of minutes. Um, we're losing our treasures. I lost my father to, co to COVID. I lost two uncles. Um, so it's, it's very hidden as hard. And we're losing a lot of our treasures, the story keepers, the storytellers, the keepers of Hanet and our, our, our ceremonial people. Um, they're special, they're gifts. At one point when I when my father was learned to be a blessing witch uh, chanter, his teacher told him, once you decide, once you get your your what you will need to do your ceremonies completed your life will no longer be yours you belong to your people and you 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 will be healing them and you will be caring for them and you will be interfacing with the holy people so your life will no longer be yours once you choose to follow that path to be uh, the keeper, the ceremonial stories, the ceremonial hanet, which everything is based upon. Our stories are made into songs. Our songs are then um, reenacted um, according to the story. So the, the, with the three combination, is how we're able to retain our our sense of, of our spirituality, which all of this that I've shared thus far ties to. And so um, I do thank you for um, taking the time to listen to me. I'm not too sure whose time I'm I'm following here. <laughs> I have one clock, and I'm not, I'm watching my clock in the house on the wall and the one on the computer. So uh, according to two of them, I'm out of time. So I'll turn it back over to Mike, Mark. Well, thank you very much, uh, Will. That was really great. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, we do have some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first one that came in asks, uh, it's very good. Uh, does academic learning eventually, with time and cultural interpretation, become knowing? Or are the two types of knowing or awareness always separate? The kind of knowing from traditional culture versus the kind of knowing from academic studies? Okay, speaking with, with academic study, um, I think... For the Navajo people, that's because we, 
we have a, a living culture that still has the life ways that are tied to it. Um, they they they're, they're basically hand in hand. So they're, they're not, um, it can be. I think for me, I, I wish one day I see a lot of new new young people who are pursuing anthropology, archaeology, ethnography, uh, and those those professions, and they're they're right now in um, doing their studies and working towards their degrees and their credentials. And I, I hope they will be the ones that will do that. And um, because they have the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that answers that. How much has that changed in your lifetime, Will? Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, the number of Navajo people who are becoming archaeologist or anthropologist. Has that changed in your lifetime? Um, among the Navajo people, it's probably more uh, readily because education is available. Now it is something that um, can be taken advantage of. And I think um, there is a going to be basically stuff that maybe an individual can't reconcile between saying what they uh, they want to say to what the way things are. And so um, it, at times you're walking this really thin line, you know, how much do I share? And I remember the, the, the old people saying, why do you write that down? What is the purpose of that? This is a living language. This is a living way of communicating, of, of knowing, of knowledge. That's why I said, you know, do you have a lifetime? Then here will make sense for you. It may be totally different than uh, something from Western education. So, Will, I got a question from somebody who has seen a Mimbrace pottery vessel that's interpreted as depicting the hero twins. And they ask, what's the relationship with that and the hero twins of the Diné? I think um, not to overstand um, my <laughs> um, amount of knowledge, I, I think hero twins. It exists, and they existed on people who moved around. People took that part of their story and used it to define them. And as I said at the beginning, we as now for people, we, I think, are uh, the best way I, I, I explained it one time is that I said, it's just kind of like uh, Star Trek, where the now for people are the Borg. They told people, lower your shield, we'll take the best part of you and make it part of the collective. <laughs> so we have elements from all these other people who join. <laughs> That's probably way off. <laughs> but I think uh, they are just really probably a true event. And there were these two. Um, to draw them closely to another living culture, I, you'll probably have to ask the members <laughs> right. what aspect of then do your comparison. But since they're probably um, their descendants, may uh, they're the ones to ask. So Thank whoever members people's descendants are, and then compare, and then the answer should be there. Thank you. I have a really good question here, uh, Will. In this time of COVID, when we must be separated, are the Navajo people still able to share stories and songs? Can the changing way we communicate help with knowing? So there's two questions here. I'll start with that one. During COVID, has this affected uh, Navajo people coming together to share traditions? I think so. My father used to speak of a time. 
I think it was probably the 1912 flu, the influenza epidemic that people were told you don't mingle, don't stay away from each other. And, and it's, I guess it was for some time too, uh, meaning I think over a year. Um, they, people miss their way of life, but I, I don't, I, they try to abide by and trusting and that they they need to do what they need to do that they did not, and that it, I I could easily see it, but um, I, I I spend a lot of my time rethinking the prayers, re rethinking the story, especially during winter time. But there's no one to share with me with. But I, for me, I get a chance to rethink them through. When when you when the knowledge we share. At, at, at let's say at the beginning the entry level children's level children's stories they're, they're either way I remember them is is my imagination I, I have the imagery it's how I remember the story and since this whole event I have a lot of time to replay my old imagery my imagination how I remember that in, because our language is not a written language um, that it's only oral spoken, and so it helps me in that way, and to rethink a, a lot of what I know. So um, I'm pretty sure it it, it 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 does hurt not being able to share uh, in the healing, not able to celebrate when a girl reaches her kinalta her coming of age, we can't go and see the mass dances and and, um, and and be part of that and, and help people heal them with their, their healing. Um, so yes, mm -hmm. I think it's very detrimental. This uh, same person asks, are the changing ways that we communicate, and I assume this means through things like the internet help with knowing or is it a hindrance or a barrier? I, I think it's a, a tool that we need to use. Um, a tool that um, needs to be developed, nurtured, uh, because that's the world of our children, our grandchildren. It's their world. And we need to be able to find a way where we allow it to survive. So yes, we re really need to learn how to use Zoom. Really need to, um, and it's, it, it's, I think it's still as good as like what you we're doing right this moment. Mm -hmm. If we can do that with young people, I think we we are there. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Are you familiar with any peeled bark CMTs with bent trunks that were used for trail markers? <clears throat> or if not trail about, markers, some other purpose? You don't talk about it. I've seen them. But of, of what we are able to extrapolate from ethnographic information through interviews, um, no, they did. Um, Sometimes I think the closest I've gone is that at old campsites, people might you know, bend over trees to help them as a tool. Um, and they, they would even, um, one elderly woman said, I, I learned how to make um, real thin sashes for my father that I put up my loom. It, it was a, our part womb. And I said, do you ever go back to see that tree? And she goes, yeah, my, my brother said it many years ago, it was still there and I didn't believe him. So we went back to our old campsite and it's, she goes, yeah, it's still there. And I could put up my loom today, but it's, it's a much bigger tree. She goes, <laughs> and then, then the time when she was little and she was 
fair, fairly long her years. I forget how old she was, but um, but in, in in our ethnographic interviews, I, I haven't had a good number of um, people uh, describing using using them as markers. Thank so, you. Um, somebody asked if you could elaborate on your understanding of rock art and whether there are stories still there to understand the rock art that we see. And then asked, is there a, a better way to name what we're seeing or a better way to, for us to talk about rock art? I think with um, being very focused and very uh, specific, um, Napa rock art is is really defined that we know that is Navajo. For for example, the the imagery you had on my uh -huh. my uh, announcing the presentation, yeah, uh, that's down in Crow Canyon in Largo. Um, that whole area in there, oral history and um, says that the holy people lived among us. And they taught us many things, they healed, um, they shared, and then they decided it needed, they needed, it was time for them to leave. So right before they were leaving, they cast their images on, onto the rock walls. And then they left via rainbow uh, sunbeam and went back to where they came from. And so what most of all those are ceremonial um, and deal with um, uh, ceremonial ways we call holy people way, the the in the in -a. And so um, I think that the best thing is to form partnerships and have outreach, uh, especially scholars, if you're gonna be doing Young scholars, if you're going to be doing work with NAFO people, is to establish that rapport where you can partner with someone. And it, it's definitely going to be a two-way street. They can help you maneuver through the, through the cultural aspect of it and the NAFO aspect of it, and they can mentor how to uh, document this information and how it is important in their studies of what they're trying to extrapolate or find out for their their, their um their, their, their data gathering for rock art thank you mm -hmm. um it's five so we're going to take a few more and then we'll um then we'll close. But somebody wrote um, that you, they were, they felt when you talked about the loss of elders who have ceremonial knowledge, they wanted to know if young people have an interest in learning and perpetuating this knowledge. I, 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 yes, they do. And uh, I've seen many of them just because in our living culture, that's where we go to maintain our our spirituality, our, our physical healing, is we use them. And I find that wonderful to see all these new medicine um, boys, <laughs> medicine men, um, who've taken it on and devote their life to it. And it, it's wonderful. And so, yes, I see it out there. Um, they, um, they are learning. Not as many as I would like it, like them to be to, to, to really help more people. That would be wonderful. But they are out there. And I Thank see many of them. 
All right. I think we'll make this the last question. And I apologize. There's some other ones that came in. Maybe we can figure out another way to get answers to people. But I think we'll make this the uh, last one tonight because we're at our we're after five o'clock. But somebody wanted to know your opinion on Bears Ears Monument and how that area should be preserved and protected. Uh, it's just uh, it's a very special place to us. There's a story about um, many stories that relate to that region in there, the, the canyon lands that, that surround Chishta Bears Ears. And it's, it's just one of those things, again, where sacred um, really needs to be um, given a little more value to the outside world. I think people have a hard time understanding sacred. Maybe at one time they did. When I was very young, I, I had the opportunity to travel throughout Europe. I do, um, it's very fortunate to have friends who had the resources and allowed me to travel with them and, and with their family. And um, I was real curious um, on why a lot of the, when I was 17, 16, 17, we found a, uh, a lot of the cathedrals were empty of generally people, especially young people I didn't see. And so, um, and to me, I would think that would be a sacred space, sacred place, yet it was empty. It really bothered me. And I was thinking, that, my boy, I hope we don't get to that situation where people don't honor what is sacred. And that, that sacredness um, is something that is probably could be um, edu uh, used to educate the population um, on, on what is important to that place. Um, I've been there many times uh, with medicine people leaving offerings. I've gone up there with medicine people making gathering plants for my medicine that was I, they were prescribing for me. Um, and so there, there, there is a, a living connection to the place. They'll never get severed. I think now that people find a way to cut the fences, <laughs> they to go to those places, which they've always known and ties to the, those ceremonies. Well, thank you very much for uh, today. And for the questions we didn't get to, we'll try to find a way to work with uh, Will to get those people answers to those questions too. But we really appreciate your presentation today, Will. And do you have anything else you want to add in the way of conclusion? Uh, I hope that someone who has the opportunity to, to watch and listen, that uh, they share the information. Um, as, I, as I said in my presentation, all this was shared with me freely. And so, and I, I use my own judgment on what I share and how much I share. And, uh, and so I plant all these little seeds of, of curiosity in people's being <laughs> that draws them to have uh, respect for the past, to have a respect for the archaeology of this beautiful region that many people occupied over a long period of time. And, are, and are still occupying it today. So that's, that's probably my, my closing. Thanks, Liz. Did you have anything before we close? Oh, no, just thank you, Will, so much for sharing your culture mm -hmm. and your personal experience with us. It means so much to all of us at Crow Canyon and, the, uh, and I know to everyone who's watching today. We're very grateful to have you as a partner. My pleasure. <laughs>
Okay. okay. Well, this will be up on YouTube. And uh, Will, I look forward to seeing you in the coming months. Hopefully, we'll be able to talk more and start our conferences again and, and see you on a regular basis. And uh, appreciate this talk and the other times that you've worked with Crow Canyon. Uh, so thank you very much. Oh, yes, thank you. Bye, everybody. I'm going in.